Hello, people. This is Lee Cole from the Lee Cole uh, Three Podcast. I'm with my partner, James Proctor. And we have a very special guest today, and we're going to discuss a project that he's doing on Whitey Bulger. And we're going to really get into Whitey Bulger uh, because he's a very interesting character in crime history. James, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing really good. How are you today, Lee? I'm good. And Loomis, welcome to our show. Should, I say, should I say Loomis or Loomis? Loomis, whatever, however you want to say it, Loomis okay. is fine. <laughs> so welcome to our show. I like your Yankee awesome. shirt. And uh, so uh, what are you looking forward to get out of today's show? I would like to like just, uh, you know, talk on some things because obviously me and you have a little bit of a past. So I just would like to also explain, um, you know, my side to that and and all uh, other stuff. And also Whitey Bulger, man, like I just want to talk, you know, if you guys. I'm, this isn't me being arrogant or nothing, but when it comes to Whitey Bulger, I mean, just I'm saying Whitey. I know the Italians out there, Patriarch, because I still got to work on. And the book that I read, My Boston Mob, is incredible. I want to dig more into that. But as far as Whitey himself and his crew. So um, explain to us about your project that you have coming up called Whitey from the Grave. All right. So Whitey from the Grave. Now, I, now I had this idea for the longest time, but as... You guys know, maybe the audience doesn't know, I did suffer from addiction issues and I couldn't get my, myself just situated. So now um, I just passed 18 months sober. So I'm very grateful for that. And uh, I'm, I'm able and capable now, if you know what I'm saying. Because yes, and congratulations but, on that. Yeah, thank you very, very much. I, I really do appreciate that, Lee. And uh, it's really incredible, like, you know, just in that short time, um, what has happened since I cleaned my act up. But um. Just, yeah, just looking to get that, you know, probably kind of explain it to why I left the workforce and, and did this and the Whitey Project and whatever you want. That's all. That's what I want to get out of it, though. But that's the project, Whitey from the Grave. We wanted to have a projected release date of the winter time. So uh, just stay tuned. Everything's being handled. There's NDAs involved. I have to be careful what I say about the project. But I could absolutely talk about Whitey's Bulger. Yeah. So there's already funding for this project. So and there's already actors that you got lined up that are interested in doing this. Is that correct? I can't answer that. I <laughs> could answer. I, I could answer the acting. Okay, you got the actors lined up, right? Correct. Okay, and you had actors that come came to you that were interested in playing this like docudrama or doc, uh, mob mob documentary type thing. Uh, they they wanted to play parts of people around Whitey. And I'm sure that you might even have your Whitey by now. Uh, yeah, well, yes. And that's also another thing that I can't discuss right now. <laughs> See, <laughs> everything changed even from like the other uh, time I talked to you on the phone. And um, we're still, what we're to basic, what we're doing is what I did in the beginning was I announced this project on my Facebook. Yeah. My real good friend, actor, Lou Silver, who I wanted to host this, reached out to me and he's like, Loomis, I got your back. Be the executive producer. Announce this thing. When I announced this thing, Lee, I was expecting a couple guys from up the neighborhood bar being like, oh, I'll play Whitey. I'll play Whitey, which was fine. And, uh, but I mean, it was unbelievable. It was overwhelming, but in a good way. And uh, the act, we were getting real good professional actors reaching out to me. Granted, I don't even have another um, uh, body of work out there. So I was like, what's going on here? But what it is after COVID and everything with actors, you know, they're all looking for something, though, good, big and real. And uh, what we're doing, I can tell you this picture, like 35 percent of a movie. With 45 percent, I think those numbers are wrong. <laughs> Sorry, 35 percent of a movie, with, you know, is movie. The rest is a documentary. So it's we're going like with a little bit of a different angle here. You're not just going to see the reenactments with. um uh, people like when they talk in documentaries, you'll just see people without dialogue or anything. That's not the case with us. We're trying to change the game in a way and and uh, do that. Yeah, there's Lou. Yep, that's Lou Silver. And Lou Silver, you can, anybody can look him up on uh, uh, Wikipedia or Google. Uh, he has a lot of stuff out there. Uh, okay, so you're going to be working with him. Uh, and... Did he did did he come to you? Was he excited about the role when you, when he seen what it was made of and stuff and how you were doing it? Well, actually, yeah, like you know, he was acting just like normal, like get it going, blah blah blah. But then there was someone who's not with us anymore, and like they sent me an email, though that loose end. It was just so nice; I couldn't believe it. But he was just saying how 
He's like, this is going to get done. Loomis has to drive. He was all excited. He's like, um, he has a great way of getting good contacts and all that stuff. And he just knows how I am from how I left the workforce. He knows my story. I really have nothing to lose here. And a guy with nothing to lose is, you know, could be a dangerous uh, guy. So uh, in a good way, dangerous business aspect. So um, that's, that's how it is. Yeah. So Lou doesn't really show his cards. Like you said, was he all excited? But he was though. He definitely absolutely was. I saw an email that he wrote to someone that was uh, very nice. And I got Lou's back for life. He was actually best friends with the actor, Frank Vincent. Mm. Frank Vincent. Yep. Yeah. Uh, James, is there anything that you want to uh, uh, ask Loomis? Yeah, so, you know, I think it's really interesting, your story, and that, you know, you've been able to um, overcome addiction. Obviously, it's a day-to-day battle, and so, you know, congratulations on 18 months of being sober. You know, you're having um, a lot of good things happen in your life. You've you know, you have a new relationship that, that you started. And so congratulations on that. And, mm-hmm. and what I wanted to ask you, so, you know, you, you had this structure of, a you know, a nine to five routine, you know, like most of us have that nine to five routine. And so um, what caused you to uh, kind of move past the nine to five that we, we all uh, are part of and to, and to where you're at now. And why did you make that change in your life? Uh, it's a pretty dark story, but uh, I'll take it back from when, okay. So when I was a musician in my twenties, I played shows and I, I, I played piano. I've been playing piano my whole life. And I always wanted to like make it in music or make it or whatever. So I was just always into the music yeah. and stuff like that. Not because I just wanted to make, I don't want fame or anything. I'm more of a behind the scenes guy. I just right. say, I want to do something that I love. And, yeah. um, but then I was like, after I got clean, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back into the workforce and just do this and make some good money and then, you know, plan accordingly. So I was out of job and I was doing fantastic. It was like the first job I ever did, fan, like, like cared for and was actually doing good. And I got laid off, which I know that happens to a lot of people. No big deal. Right. But it was like, ah, man, you know, OK, it is what it is. Then I got hired with a big time. They're called Vastec out in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And they, people fly in from Ireland, Japan, everything there. It's like a university for screen printing, like with shirts and stuff. And uh, so I went there for a schooling and then I came back and they called me three weeks later and they're like, yo, we love your, we love your show. Uh, I'm also in recovery. Uh, we could do big things. They drew a great salary at me. They gave me a company vehicle, one of those Hummers. Um, they, they wanted to give that to me. So I didn't have to pay gas, give me a credit card. And it was a lot of money. We'll put it at that for uh what I was going to make. And don't forget their company car and they're paying for my gas. So that alone adds up your money, your value. So they went out on a Thursday night. It was, his name was Scott. And I don't want to say the other guy's name wrong, no disrespect, but Scott was the CEO. And there's another guy who hired me and now he was the head of management. They went out Thursday and they said, Loomis, we love your stuff. We're going to be an amazing team. We have the Hummer here. Can you come and meet us at the club? And I'm like, the club? I go, guys, I'm sober now. Um, I just really don't want to go into, like, it was like a rave type uh, atmosphere. They're like, no problem. So they're texting me all night. They're like, we'll call you tomorrow with details. And they were drunk. You could tell with the text after 2 a.m. So Friday comes. I heard nothing. So I was just like, oh, they were out all night. You know, they didn't wake up for work. Let them sleep it off. Saturday and Sunday, they're not work days. So I didn't take them personally. And then Monday, I was with my mother, and we were down uh, doing something with my taxes, and my my cell phone was on the table, and I guess she was standing over it, and she's like, you might want to read this, and it was my boss, the manager's phone, but it was his wife, and she's like, Loomis, I'm sure you heard by now, um, oh God, what's his name again? It's, it's, a, it's like a Puerto Rican name, I can't remember the name, but uh, him and Scott, though, got killed uh, in the uh, uh, that night by a huge trailer in the Hummer that I was supposed to be driving. And it hurt me. It hurt me a lot because I get survivor's guilt sometimes thinking like, man, I always designate drive for my friends. I I put Facebook posts up telling people, if you're driving, please call me. I don't even, if I don't know you, I'll pick you up. And um, that hurt, that was bothering me until my good friend told me, no, I know you Loomis, you're trying to get that job. If this guy was like, I'm fine to drive, you could have been in that car too. And you were, you were looking out for your sobriety at the end of the day. So, you know, no fault on you. Lee, you have to remember, I, we were already celebrated everything with my family and um, they still like wanted me to work there, but I couldn't do it after that. 
I just can't, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, they're dead. All right. Well, hey, I just I have integrity at the end of the day. And uh, sometimes I have too much of it, though, because it could hurt you. Um, but after that, I just said, that's it. I had like a spiritual type feeling like awakening. It was just like, just do what you love. At least take one year off doing what you love and stop working for the man and see how it goes. I have no children. I have none of that. So and there was a lot of other things, Lee, that were happening, too. But like those were the like that's the major stuff that was happening. But I was seeing the writing on the wall. And now, I mean, I mean, I'm glad I did it now, to be honest with you, you know, because uh, a lot of great stuff's going on. And life every day is a new adventure being sober, I'll tell you that. But And, and you're learning that this YouTube thing is uh, is not as easy as people think it is, is it? No, and I'm going to do a shameless plug because I don't see it. But yeah, guys, I do a show called Mafia Truth. Subscribe to oh, that. It'll be, under, it'll be underneath. When this yeah, gets I know. I, I do a song. That's why I started the Mafia Truth, Lee. It yeah. was around the Johnny Depp trial time. I interviewed two people and I had my friend Scott on from so well, he was sober sit down. Now he started a new show, show called stepping up. And um, I had him on and my sponsor on talking about addiction and did the Johnny Depp trial. And then after the Johnny Depp trial is when John red Shea called in. And then after that, I switched everything over to uh, mafia truth, which I still wish it was the Loomis show because uh, that wasn't my idea. I'm being honest though with the mafia truth. And um you know, some people try to get you to do stuff in this genre and uh, just to, to benefit them. And you got to really, really look out for yourself. You oh, know? you do. And that's what it's about. It's about doing your own show, not get, getting involved. I've, I've made that mistake, unfortunately, and, and moving on from there. But, you know, you're doing a great thing right now. And you're 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 deciding to do a, 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 a great documentary. I'm sure it's going to be great. And I know you know an awful lot about Whitey Bulger. Let me ask you a question. When you see what they say about Whitey Bulger and what you know about him, and say Red Shea. Now, Red Shea, you, he's a friend of yours. He, he worked for uh, Whitey Bulger. He knew Whitey Bulger. How much truth do we hear about Whitey Bulger out there? I, I would say maybe, maybe in the 60 percentile. So we know he was evil. We know he was a bad man, but there was a lot of things that he did right. Yeah, I mean, he did. But at the end of the day, he was he was an evil man. I'm not trying to be an apologist for Whitey or make him a benevolent gangster, but you hear names like Greg Scarpa or Danny Green, for instance, who was an FBI informant out in Ohio, like the Cleveland mob wars. Why don't we hear so much hate on those guys who were actually, there's all the evidence there. They signed everything. They fingerprinted everything. Whitey's informant file is like this, this, this thick. Scarp is like that, and Whitey was an informant longer. Woo! My name is Eugene Oliva. I'm a Marine Corps post-9-11 service civil combat veteran and founder and CEO of Semperfy Associates LLC. I'm also a broker and co-owner of PHP Agency, which is an integrity marketing group inc. company, the second largest insurance marketing organization in the world. I'm guaranteeing you a $100 no-strings-attached food voucher that you can use for over 250,000 offers across the United States and Canada at over 55,000 chains and restaurants. And you'll get one just for joining us for our complimentary, no obligation, one hour Zoom. Our referral business partner program is simply a way where you can make additional income, which in turn helps promote our brand while we provide financial literacy to those you refer to us. Whether you're a stay-at-home parent, already working from home, oh yes, by the way, you can work 100% remotely. Business owners and nonprofits are also welcome to join us as we will teach you ways to drive traffic and donors to you at zero cost to your business or organization as well. For those of you who are interested, you can directly message our socials or emails. That's it, folks. Thank and why do you never signed or done anything? And we're not going after the informant just file. We're more wondering, like, what happened here? Because how did he end up in the prison where he got murdered? Why is Freddie Geese not being charged for four years later? And why is he in the hole the whole entire time? It's just a lot of, uh, a lot of, like, crazy stuff, though. Because, I mean, Freddie... You know, allegedly he knew what was going to happen. I mean, he shaved his head. I mean, he, he bought out commissary like right after, like he knew. And um, so that's what I mean. Like why Whitey Bulger is a huge, like it's a celebrity name now, especially after Johnny yeah. Depp doing that movie. I just don't see how you screw that up. You know, by, um, I know that everyone, when you, when you go into intake, they ask you, are you affiliated with them? I get that, but come on, Lee. Whitey Bulger. You're telling me they didn't have a phone call into the warden or whatever. Like you're getting James Whitey Bulger into your prison. Like they, they had to have. He went, he went from, 
he wound up going to Hazleton from a hospital that was, uh, it was a hospital that I believe Florida. And that's where they kept the, the people that were sick. He was in his mid eighties. He was not getting better. There was absolutely no reason to send him to, they said, because he was fighting with the nurse. He's a mid 80 year old man fighting with a nurse. Oh, you can't handle that. I know. <laughs> you I know, know. It, it makes no sense. They act like he's a 30 year old guy threatening a nurse. He's a grumpy 88 year old man fighting fighting with a nurse and made no ex do you think now when we talk about this we know that john Connolly wind up taking the brunt of everything uh when it came with the fbi uh do you believe that whitey uh bolger was taken out because there was a lot it was a lot deeper than just john Connolly? yeah like i yeah absolutely because i mean he was writing a lot of memoirs that they that they ripped up and uh he had some stuff on some other agents too. Well, I don't know if he had the exact evidence, but I mean, some stuff that we know from his side. See, nobody ever heard Whitey's side, you know, and that's what we're doing. And it's not to be like, oh, look, he's a great guy. No, but Lee, if you, if James calls me up and says, Lee's got your pin number, let's say, and he's trying to rob, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I, I found out you don't react until you hear everyone's side of the story or whatever. And we never even heard his side, really, except in that whitey United States of America, just about the informant file when he was saying, yes. like, I'm not. And um, so we just want all sides in there. And to, to ask your question, too, uh, from back way before, I'm really just going after the truth. And I'm not one of these guys who's like, if I'm sitting out with Pat Nee and he's lying, I'm not just going to be like, oh, throw that out there. No, because a lot of these guys serve their own ego. So you got to really you know, do the research and really talk to other people who are there. Yeah. And I love though, like I love that I have a great relationship though with John, because at the end of the day, I could trust John. Now John, explain, explain to people who, who John is. John Red Shea wrote the book Rap Bastards, but he, before that he worked for Whitey Bulger and he ran his drug entity. Now when John got, when they did a huge roundup of everyone, it was 50 people before right, Whitey, uh, was even said to be an informant. 50 people got locked up. John was like the leader of all that. He, he had all those people, not one of them would, te would, would testify or say anything. But out of everyone though who ran his one of Whitey's entities, he kept his mouth shut. He always was defending Bolger. When the spotlight team came out and they said Whitey's a rat, he was already inside prison. And uh, he he was like defending Whitey. Like, no, 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 what are you talking about? This snap. But then nobody really found out. Um, it broke his heart. Obviously, I'd, I've got a question for you. Um, so the other person that you that you that I would call uh, an expert just because not saying he's accurate or whatever, but, you know, he's written at least three books about uh, Whitey Bulger and that's Kevin Weeks. Uh, what's your thoughts on him? I mean, obviously he was an informant, right? And yeah, he was an informant, though. And uh, yeah. you just I just I. Uh, I still take everything at face value though with that. And especially I don't want to put words into anyone's mouth from out mm. there or like what I don't heard though about him though. But I, uh, I mean, after Whitey, here's, let me just tell you the, the difference after yeah. Bulger was um, known as an FBI informant. It took Kevin weeks, two weeks to cooperate, two weeks. John mm. was already in there for four years. They told him like, Hey, will you talk to us? And he stayed in there to finish his eight, eight more years when he could have easily walked out. It's the best excuse in the world. What are you talking about? Like Kevin Weeks says, you can't rat on a rat. Well, according to John Red Shea, yes, you can. Great you know, the story of him, um, is that true that I guess they were playing football or something on the set and uh, bought Alec Baldwin on the departed and he fractured Shea's thumb. Wow, I never even, I didn't even know that. Look yeah, at you. Yes, that's true. I read it. Yeah. I'll ask John, I'll ask in the, um, this was a long time ago. It was in uh, Contact Music. They did a thing saying Baldwin breaks Felon's thumb in a football game. And I guess it was for the departed and supposedly fractured his, his thumb or something. Wait, he broke John's thumb? Yeah, yeah. You're playing football, you know. Oh, playing like football. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it, it must have been, it was tackle football, you know. <laughs> oh, well, definitely. I'm sure that it was, though. And uh, what was it? I, I was going to say, uh, yeah, I was going to say, thank God it wasn't um, uh, like gunfighting for a movie or something, right? You know, just. Yeah, football. yeah, exactly. They said in the <laughs> article, it was a short thing. It said Alec Baldwin risked serious injury when he accidentally fractured a former felon's thumb during a game of football on the set of The Departed. 
and they said that the movie stars, castmates, and crew members refused to take Baldwin seriously when he turned up for the game in a suit and a tie, but he won them over with one fiery throw. And they said, uh, however, one of the co-stars, Mark Wahlberg's friends, who's, who Shea wasn't impressed after he left, injured and so Wahlberg had to step in to prevent a nasty altercation so now we know Baldwin breaks fingers he shoots people yeah. <laughs> he turned out to be a pretty rugged guy I guess yeah oh, by the I guess way, he was upset at first but he said yeah it's all good you know <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the making of this show just so people know they did charge they did drop all the charges on Baldwin on the murder charges uh, oh yes. did they yes yesterday okay okay and I want to show you somebody else. yeah I know you're not going to like this guy because uh he gets away with a lot, and he was actually probably more ruthless than Whitey. Let's talk about this guy right here. Stevie Fleming. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about yeah. Stevie Fleming. Well, in Whitey's, even in Whitey's words, though, Stevie made him look like a choir boy. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just give you an idea of, uh, of their character. Basically, like for Christmas, Whitey got Stevie dental pliers for taking out the teeth and it had his like little name, like engraved on him and stuff like that. So that just gives you an idea of their mindset. But sure, Stevie, sure Fleming, yeah. Stevie Fleming, the rifleman, Fleming got that name from back in the gang war days. And he was just a phenomenal shooter with the rifle. That's how he got that. But he also had a brother named the bear and this kid that he was just killing everything. And he got killed um, back in the gangland days. And um, he's just, Fleming's just like sicko, He's definitely the one that's the pedophile. What is Sam? No offense, Sammy the Bull. What are you talking about? You did not. You talked to Stevie Fleming and then you did a whole show on Whitey. You don't know what you're talking about. I respect you, but I'm just letting you know if you ever see this, stop it because you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, because Sammy's Sammy uh, Gravano is known for uh, for um, telling mistruths on his story. Well, yeah, yeah, but he was saying though that that Whitey was the one that that he's like he said Fleming was a great guy and he just was all torn up because yeah. Whitey killed Whitey killed um Deborah Hussey and Stevie was all torn up and bloody da 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 and it's well, just Flynn, like yeah but he just Flynn has is... such a big audience that's what aggravates me he has such a huge audience right. and it's so it's just so inaccurate with the bull I'm just saying the Bulger story because I don't yeah, watch Flynn, it every Timmy had uh sexually molested you know uh her for years you know Deborah Hulsey and, and it's just yeah, there's nothing good about it. I didn't realize that Steve Flemmy, uh, that girl became girlfriends because he molested her. And what did he groom her? How did that work? Yeah, like so, like he was just basically grooming, like he was grooming her. It was, it was the girl. It was his wife's daughter. His wife's. So it's his stepdaughter. Yeah. 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 That's what. That's so what that I'm gives sure. you another idea of uh, whatever. But then also too, there's a no finding in the one case with the girl with Deborah Davis with Whitey. And uh, but at the end of the day, it was Stevie and Whitey. But I don't know Whitey and his. You know, he always says, "No, nah, no, nah, I think they were Stevie's girls. I didn't kill them. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure it was probably Stevie's, or maybe Whitey's. Like they got to go because Stevie would talk a lot, loose lip sync shit. Right. You know. So, but in the movie, got... they actually had Whitey choking him to death. Yes. You know, so it, it made Whitey look like he just choked. His... No one knows besides Flemmy and uh, Whitey what happened there. Basically. Well, Kevin Weeks though does say that. Uh, he saw that happen. Okay, so what did Kevin Weeks say he's seen happen? That Jim Bolger, she just started choking her. She turned blue and, uh, you know, just choked her right there, killed her. And then Stevie pulled out the teeth and they cut the hands off of the feet. And they buried him in a house called the Haunty. Sammy again. Again, nothing against Sammy the Bull. I'm just saying, though, like, it, it's, don't I don't like people who change. all Like, don't alter history, man. We got more people being born that are going to look into this stuff. Yeah, Sammy like, does that. Sammy does that on everything he talks about. Alters history. That's just Sammy Gravano. Okay. That's why. Do you know what's so bad though about this though, Lee? Is you got to be careful though when you're looking for history with these guys because they're they're trying to serve their egos. So you really have to be careful from what they say. Let's talk about another person now. A person that you know, uh, Billy Bulger. Now this yeah. guy was uh he was a high he was the most highest decorated I mean he was the highest uh what was his what was he again um president of president? the senate for Massachusetts and, and he was you guys yeah and wasn't he like uh very well respected in that institution in there oh my god like so everyone from Southie 
And I told uh, James this earlier. Um, everyone from Southie loved him because whenever his constituents came, like the priest or anyone, like he would just give them money like that. And there's a 60 minute interview that just came out. I'll send it to you where they're even like, you know, though, that people know, like, you know, everything that's going on in this aura and the power. And he even says, he's like, yeah, he's like, well, it works good for me talking about like his brother and stuff like that. But we do know for a fact, and Whitey also wrote this, Whitey absolutely never wanted to get Billy involved. And I believe that, but Billy apps, I just think like he, there was a conversation with John Connolly saying, look out for my brother. I don't know if it was make him a top echelon informant and look out for him and all that stuff. But this guy absolutely was one of the most powerful men. But if the, he was about, he was the most powerful guy in Boston with his brother. I mean, they both ran it, the underworld and the political world. And he escaped all the pressures of everything until it really got bad. When I guess when he got when when Whitey finally got busted, uh, and then um, at that time Bolger was at a university, in Massachusetts University, wasn't he? And he was basically forced to step down. Yes, correct, because he pled the fifth. Uh, but when they asked him if he ever spoke with his brother, because he had a conversation with him on the phone. Yeah, and my understanding is that they had problems even before that. That because you remember he was, um, I I think it was with Mitt Romney, right? He was the governor at the time, and yeah, yeah. yeah and then they said he, you know, had to had to resign. But um, you know, apparently, my understanding is if this is true, I, they they had tried uh, the feds and different people looking for Whitey had. Uh, went to William Bolger and he he wouldn't cooperate with them, right? And so I, I'm assuming that they had conversations, right? I mean, yeah. years, Whitey and his brother. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. And the, the guys, I don't know, like, I just got to tell you so many holes, though, with the FBI real quick. So yeah. when Whitey went on the run at first, he went on the run with a girl, with a woman named um, Teresa Stanley. And then so they go on the run and uh, Whitey ends up though bringing Teresa Stanley back after 10 months and then picks up Catherine Gregg because Teresa Stanley was homesick. Did, did Whitey actually bring her back to the state himself? Yes. He, this is when he had all these people looking for him. He came yes. back. To the, wow. Yeah, he came right in and picked Catherine up. Yeah. He also wanted to come back. Oh, I can't. But see, I got to be careful with some right, stuff. Right. But, but um, he... Uh, what was I saying again? I think I lost my job. Yeah, we're talking about where they brought him, brought her back. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the FBI, what do they do? They put watch. They go to the wrong house and say, "Oh, she wasn't home. That's on file." They went to the wrong house. How do you screw that up with her? And then they didn't even try to contact her for ten. I'm sorry, thirteen months after she was home, she had his alias. Mm -hmm. She had everything. And then that makes you wonder, though, too, why didn't why did he just kill her if he's so calculated? Like, why didn't he just kill her? And then, uh, I don't but know. He wore Catherine Gregg. Didn't he, at the same trip when he brought her back, didn't he pick up Catherine at the same time? Yes, that is when he yeah. picked up Catherine. And yeah. then, so, yeah, he definitely wanted a woman with him for up to be on the run. And um, I'm just saying, though, there's just so... What's getting me mad is that there's FBI agents still out there, like uh, the this and that, who are dirty. Yeah, dirty. If you all think it's John Connolly, then you're sadly mistaken. He's the scapegoat. Yes, Connolly was absolutely involved, but he was the big scapegoat for the government. Why? Because the government can't say it was all the FBI or ten agents or whatever. If you guys think Whitey only had him and John Morris, everyone's sadly mistaken. Okay, now you have. Okay, so. Explain, okay, when he leaves with uh, with uh, Greg and he takes off, did he go directly to California uh, or did he like jump around a little bit? Indiana is all I got. I got Indiana and then out to California. Indiana. He was in Indiana for a while and he thought that his uh, cover was being blown and that's like when they went out west. Do you remember when they uh, were looking for him and they put him in Italy and France and England? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody seen him here. Someone seen him there. Remember that? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Why, after 16 years, do they just say, oh, let's put a PSA out on Catherine Gregg and two days later they're busted? Because I got a bunch, I'll, I'll bet you that uh, FBI changed over and new people came in. That's what okay. I'll bet you. Uh, some of the old people there probably didn't want to even bring him in. 
Exactly. Because he's a lot of politicians too and stuff. Like Whitey had contacts. Whitey had a lot of contacts and he was an extremely powerful man. I see yeah, people on these shows, a lot of Italians on these shows saying, yeah, Whitey's crew was dead. But listen, don't be fooled. Whitey yeah, Bolger absolutely yeah, just no doubt. I mean, how, the show. How did he um they said one of the things interesting to me is that so you know so he never went to Italy, he wasn't in Europe, but they said he did, he would go across the border to Mexico from California. So I'm assuming in um uh, Tijuana, because uh, he had buy meds for his uh he had um, yeah. heart issues. And so how was he doing that? I'm assuming he must have had a, fa a fake passport or something. Passport and not to mention, though, like, you know, we still have to get and speak, though, with the actual people that he was beating. But Catherine, though, too. Catherine, yeah. though, can handle that and take care of that, though. Yeah, for him. she and could have been the one to go over there. Here's how smart white he was, though. And I'm not saying, though, like, but he has so much money that yeah, they found the 800,000 plus mm -hmm. in his walls. But he would purposely just, and he wrote this in his memoirs, he would put money in safety deposit boxes wherever, just, and he knew he was never going to get that money back, just to, like, throw people off. This guy, he was just, like, it moves to in front of that. Like, even back in the day, he would always put little pieces of tape by the door, and when he'd go back home, if one of those pieces of tape were his mood, he was just very careful. Every time he made any type of money, he'd drive, like, 16 hours to a casino. And, mm. put, you know, even if it was, like, 2000 bucks, 3000 he was just... And then, and then the IRS is ready to try to take him down. He wins the lottery. <laughs> right when they were about to, with Dunley, they're about to like go after him, and then he wins the lottery. I mean, I know that, that was during the middle of his criminal career, right? Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. He just happened to win the lottery. His brother is Billy Bolger. Right? Yeah, but you know what it was though. Why did he though own though the, the liquor store that he took out Stephen Rakes, and um, so the, the winning number was purchased there. But I'm sure that guy got a phone call immediately, like, hey, we're your partners. <laughs> you know? What are you gonna do? 14 million or something? Yeah. 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 What was the deal with the firearms at the, so you remember they, they always said that they found the eight hundred thousand in cash, the I guess fake IDs, but there was like yeah, 30 yeah. firearms. And, and James, we're gonna do that in one second. I just wanna before we get Sorry. to the wall, mm -hmm. explain to explain to us. When exactly did he hit his final destination in California, where it was, and how long he was there, if you don't mind? Yeah, for, so from my research and everything that we looked at, too, is he was really only in Indiana for like six, seven months and then went right out to Cali. But you got to remember this. In the beginning, nobody knows because he was meeting Kevin Weeks in New York City. So there were other places that he was going, Chicago. So, you know, that's like when he would meet. And then the, the last one, I think he met Kevin Weeks. Um, in New York. This was like around the time, though, like the first year, though, when he was on the run. So he didn't go like right to Indiana. So he right. was somewhere. And Kevin Weeks is like, dude, he walks right up to cops asking for directions and stuff. Whitey, like he does it like that's He just was so normal. But here, the fascination with this guy is how do you flip the switch like that and just be a normal citizen when you were like one of the most ruthless gangsters of all time? And um, I, he's just very intelligent. What year and, do uh, they what year do they say? Did he move to that? Like, where exactly did he live in California? Okay, so he lived on the Third Street Promenade at the Princess Eugenia, which is in Santa Monica, California. I was there. I went to the I went to the actual place. Yeah. And when they caught, uh, okay, now I'll let James pick this up with the money in the wall. Your question, James. Yeah. So so he was there for fifteen years, and so after that first year, so we know the first year he was speaking with Weeks in New York City. You know, then he goes to um, Indiana. So uh, did he pretty much, was he totally bifurcated from all of that former life for the final 15 years? Or was, uh, did he still have any involvement at all with people back in uh, Boston, the Northeast or New England? Well, his words are in 16 years, I never committed a crime except for being on the run, obviously. But in 16 years with Catherine, I what was his almost all in verbatim 16 years on the run with Catherine. I never committed a crime. She kind of make she kind of made me become human. And that's that was his words. So, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, he had contacts, I'm sure, you know. And if you're going to tell me, though, that nobody was helping him a little bit or like he wasn't like reaching out to the FBI or this or that. And even the whole Billy Bolger phone call thing was weird because he got a phone call from someone else. Then he had to go to one house, then another house, and then take the phone call. 
So Whitey was still, I mean, obviously, to, like he had to be talking to someone. I mean, you know, in 16 years, man, that's a long time. And he was, I, I went late. This place is so wide open. And maybe that's why. Maybe he was smart, but I just don't buy it. With all he looks the like stuff. he looks like your average Joe. You put on a baseball cap, you, you know. Look, he had the beard when he was busted. You know, he looked like the average Joe. You, who would recognize him? It's, and it's he didn't like, look like someone to be scared of. He looked like a grandpa type figure. Yeah. So it's and not really it, like yeah. looking for a scary yeah. tattooed up gang member. So it, you know, he wasn't an easy find. No, but they weren't looking for him real hard. No way. So they didn't even go to Teresa Stanley's house until 13 months after he brought her back. They knew she was back. Then they go to the rock. You know what their excuse was? Oh, we went to the wrong house. So you didn't follow up. Yeah. Yep, a lot like, of stuff. Like, I, it's unbelievable. And I know I have to watch myself with some of the stuff that we're going to be doing and like releasing because there's still people out there that are probably worried about getting in trouble. This and that. But I'm someone, Lee, that has nothing to lose. <laughs> yeah. Did he stay? Did did Whitey stay at, in Santa Monica? Did he go out into the public, or was he a stay-at-home guy, or did he just try to fit into the community? He would go out to the public, and he really loved helping. Like, like he would go to uh, like anyone needed flat tire help. He was the first one to get out and system and stuff. This is from Catherine, his girlfriend. Sorry about that. Hold on, no problem. let me just check this out. Um, so he would uh, do that, and. Um, Sorry, that threw me off. What was the exact question again? Oh, uh, would, would Whitey, was he fitting in with the community where he was and stuff? Okay, so, so not not really. Like, he wasn't out all the time. Like, they would go out for walks and stuff. But during, when Osama Bin Laden was caught, though, he didn't even, like, go out at all. And they started putting the, the paper up on the door saying, do not disturb. He's getting dementia and all that. But for the most part, the only stories you really hear is about sto the entire stories are from, like, when he was on the run going uh, to California and then he was more a shut-in, but still went out here and there. But no, he wasn't like, what's up, Bobby? But inside the Princess Eugenia, he was very friendly with everyone. He would hand them, like, flashlights and, like, little knives and stuff and to protect themselves. He'd give the women who lived there mace. And uh, so in that building, it's an apartment complex, okay? So, and then, like, you know, they all have their storage underneath, underground. That's where the feds, how the feds got them. But, um... So I guess that building would be a community in itself. So, but yes, he did speak with the people from the Princess Eugenia, but all out and about in the community, no. And you know what? You would also be hearing people coming out of the woodwork too, like being like, hey, I knew him real good and blah, blah, blah. We didn't even really hear any stories from anyone like that really saw him on the run, you know? Explain to us how he was busted. Okay. It's laughable, but uh, they put a PSA out on Catherine Gregg. And uh, two days later, yeah, they got they got the tip. Well, they got the tip before that, but he was gone two days later. It's all over like a stray cat. That that's what really brought Whitey down. We always I wrote a, we wrote a song called uh, um, Mr. Bulger, and uh, it's like you know beauty queen and a stray cat. So a girl from Iceland who was a beauty queen uh, noticed them from when she was in California. They would always come outside and feed this stray cat, and they bond it like over this cat. So she's just sitting in Iceland and she sees the PSA on Catherine and she's like, oh my God, that's them. And uh, she called and uh, yeah, $2 million reward. More actually, 200, well, it's 200. I think Catherine's just 200,000. So. so this woman actually got the reward? Yeah. Wow. And so I, so we're, when they went to get Bolger, were they worried that it was going to be a shootout and stuff? Oh, well, that, that's what it was supposed to be. Whitey always said, if I'm going, we're going to war. And why do you think everything was in the wall? Back to your question about the wall and the guns. Yeah. Uh, he had grenades. He had freak. He had everything. And um, with the money in there as well. But he was prepared. And he even said, if that was me 20, 30 years ago, they never would have had me slip in like that. And uh, so he walks. They called him up. They said someone broke into the storage um, rocker. There's an underground parkade. And um, just like in any apartment complex, and they, 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 they everyone has their own storage lock, locker. So they called up, the manager called up and said, hey, Jimmy, or not Jimmy, Charlie Gasco was the name he was going by. Hey, Charlie, um, someone broke into your storage locker. And that's when Whitey went down. Whitey walks in the garage and they just get swarmed. And they said, get on your fucking knees. And he goes, you get on your fucking knees immediately. <laughs> Did he get, so that tells you his character. He just goes, you get on your fucking knees. And uh and then after that, and then it's funny, though, they're like, Whitey, aren't you kind of relieved now? Like, you know, like, 
okay, it's over, blah, blah, blah. He's like, what are you fucking nuts? Yeah, like, what the fuck? Why would he be relieved? He was living in California. And, uh, you know? Excuse my language there. I'm trying to clean my language up. But yeah, that's okay. You, like, one or two swears don't mean nothing here. Uh, uh, you do, you went a long time without cursing. It, just so people know, we did another video, and this is a remake of that video because we wanted to cut back on the swearing and do a different type. I kind of like the way the direction this video is going so far. Uh, very impressed with it. Um, okay, so... So now we know he gets busted with uh, with, with Captain Greg and 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 they bring him back and uh, there's him getting off the plane. Actually, he looks pretty good for a man his age. No, he does. And well, why do you always, even when he was in prison after um, he was released, always still working out? Oh, he was like John Gotti in that in that sense. With John Gotti, would just bang out push ups constantly. That's how white he was. Uh, very very uh, disciplined. He was also a health uh, like a health freak. And he would actually fight his old crew if they were eating McDonald's. We actually have some footage of that. That's funny, where he's slapping one of his guys around for fun for eating McDonald's, like by his car. But oh, yeah, um, a video of that—that that does sound funny. Yeah, yeah. No, you'll see it eventually. And then um, we, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't talk about that. Sorry. Oh, you, you, that's, 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 <laughs> that sounds great, you know. And so, so he gets back, and so uh, when he gets back, he's very in love and dedicated to the woman he was with. Is, is that true? 100%. And this is also true. He did, though, say, he said, listen, why do we, the, the whole trial of Whitey Bulger was just a circus show. That's all it was. It was just a circus show. And um, he, uh, they didn't even need to do that because Whitey was like, listen, I'll, I'll plead guilty to everything right now, just let Catherine go. And, um, and that's actually like on record. And uh, no, they wanted to just do the whole trial, do the whole circus act because it's a big, they really want. And how about this? He wasn't charged for being an informant. The whole trial was about him if he was an informant or not. That's not even a charge. It has nothing to do with the trial. Why was the government so keen on proving he was informant and John Connolly and blah, blah, blah. If uh, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense though. Um, when you just look at there's just too many holes in it. And I'm just so grateful back to the sobriety thing. I've been watching this stuff and researching this stuff and talking to people from that from since I don't even know how far back. Then I finally get sober. And now I'm in charge of like, you know, this could be an international documentary. It's just it's a trip, man. But uh, everyone's going to find out a lot of new stuff. I really wish I could go into details. Oh, you're but doing I know great. Lee, Lee, you know what the NDAs are like. Um, for, you know, I'm sure you had to deal with that stuff. So I just I'm, have to I'm, I'm in the middle of one right now. Yeah. Uh, so, James, is there something that you want to ask him about this period of time? Uh, yeah. So. So, yeah. So, you know, he has the trial. And, you know, I had a question. Do we want to go to when he was in the penitentiary or, or did we want to still cover the trial? Where, no, you, wherever you want to go now. As long okay. as you have yeah. So one of the things that, you know, my understanding is so uh, he was sent down to. Um, he was in West Virginia for a while. He was in Sumterville at, at Coleman, right? In, Not West in, Virginia for a while. He was in West Virginia for six hours. To, then he was murdered. Yeah. Oh, okay. But then that was kind of before he, but he was in uh, Sumterville. USP, two, USP Tucson and then USP Coleman and then Virginia. Okay. And so um, in Coleman, what they're saying is, is that, you know, that's when his behavior, he was having behavior issues in prison and so they said that he was apparently disciplined multiple times and then is it true they said that he was um disciplined for masturbating in front of a male staff member and then also threatening a female medical staff member so do you know about those instances i know that the threatening is a fact but the other thing though with uh, what you said there was a thing that he would do with his legs because you know, that's why he was in a wheelchair and I mm -hmm. guess they called it, they called it like creaming his legs. So, I mean, like his cock was out, but I mean, creaming his legs and I don't know, but maybe. Yeah, was, they're trying to say he was masturbating in front of a male staff member. Yeah, so, but, you know, but, I thought it was, uh, but here's yeah. what it comes down to, James, when you really think yeah. about it. So that was reason to send him to one of the most uh, uh, ruthless prisons into. Uh, yeah, he couldn't walk. He, yeah, his, it, it, and to put him in, in and to put him out and not even to put him right away. He should have went in. 
to protective custody. The minute he walked through that door, exactly. bing, protective custody. But no, let's put him down by one of the most feared killers there, a guy that hated rats, a guy that was mm -hmm. put there because of rats, uh, and uh, and Freddie Gias and his friends. I mean, so... Why wasn't it, he at, like, um, I don't know, the Butner or maybe uh, even uh, in Missouri at, at uh, Springfield, somewhere where he, he needed intensive medical care I don't understand why he was, it, no, he was it, taken yeah. to Hazleton. And on top of that, they're trying to say this was an out-of-control 80-year-old man. Get real. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is why, though, we're doing, though, the docuseries, though, is because of this. Like, everything you're asking is my questions. Yeah. And um, it's just, uh, I really can't answer everything that you just asked because that's that's what we're looking for right. for this docuseries. But, I mean, they're great questions. And, um like, there's just so many holes in it. Like, so, oh, can I just get rid of this rule? Some people were saying that Freddie Giaz was all on Suboxone and, and, and then screwed up in there. No, he wasn't. There's just other channels who just make stuff up. That's a lie. And um, just so people know, um, Freddie was absolutely uh, respected and feared in there because I talked to people who were actually in there with him. So, yeah, he was just, part of the um, big Al Bruno hit, right? I believe. Yeah, yeah. Freddie GS was was uh, pretty much in there because of Arolada. We all know that. Mm -hmm. And Arolada was his boss. Arolada wound up ratting him and his brother out, and they're in prison for life. And uh, he he had no he did not want to come across any rats. And that was the right. last guy you wanted to put. I mean, this is Whitey Bulger. Everybody knew who it was when he came in. It's not like they didn't know. Oh, who's that guy coming? Down? No, they knew. They it was said that that the prison knew before he even arrived, he was coming. Oh, 100%. 100%. Who does even that? A guy, yeah. A guy who I have attached to the project. I can't, well, if I don't say his name, I could tell you this. Uh, yeah. They want, they absolutely knew why he was coming. So, and even if they knew if he was coming, okay, he's coming, but we're going to put him in protective custody right away. It's you insane. Know? It's insane. I know that's that, and then, that they didn't, they actually put him in with a cellmate. And, yeah, uh, cellmate. Yeah. The black, a black cellmate too. And uh, that's just different in prisons. Like, you know, and so there's just. You never just, do that. So never. I mean, that's just crazy to do Many that. Many people from other prisons, wardens from yeah. other prisons have come out. Many of them and said that th these are procedures they would have never done in their prison. And they don't understand why it was done here. And it was never done like this in this prison before. You know. And the prison was known as one of the worst prisons, understaffed, a lot of, I mean, it's a bad place to go. And um, and then don't forget that this guy was in USB Tucson, which is uh, like he was like in a witness type unit. Um, mm -hmm. And then he was um, in Coleman, Coleman 2, um, which is that as well. And then the worst prison, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's just... They could have sent uh, him. To, they could have sent him to Florence, Colorado, and had him locked up all by himself right away. And I can tell you my opinion. My opinion is on Whitey himself. I think he wanted to go. He was eighty nine and whatever, because he definitely wasn't from witness account. He wasn't just being like, "Help me!" No, he stayed silent and sat in his wheelchair the whole time with his back turned. And then, boom, they came in. There was no noise. He was gone like right away. And um, but then they 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 were beating him for like seven minutes, I think. And that's and a long they, got time. The, they got the video of them coming in and out of the, and it took them for like eight minutes to realize that there was something wrong was on the video that these guys were going in there. The video is put there for the purpose of watching prisoners going into cells. Mm -hmm. And it took them eight minutes to see this. So why yeah. is Freddie, why, why wasn't Freddie charged for till four years after the fact? And why are they tortured Freddie and put him in absolute lockup? Where he couldn't even see anybody. Nothing. I know. Nothing. And um that's what that's what we don't understand. And he's still, you know, he's been in the hole the whole time. And they, they, uh, they, they finally after they just uh bought him out and charged him, uh they finally are, are giving him some space, only uh, some more freedom, uh, only because his lawyers filed things, all sorts of stuff to the courts and everything. He's still in a very bad situation, but it's not as bad as it was up until the time he was charged. So what you're saying is like if he didn't have any lawyer or anything good like that, then he'd be fucking screwed. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't have let him accept mail and stuff. 
and, and I know that he's, he, he gets mail now. I know that for a fact. I'm not going to say how, but I know that. And uh, so they, they were keeping everything. They, they, it was like it was like he was uh, Pablo Escobar or uh, that other guy down there that they got oh, locked Chapo. up. Yeah, uh, Chapo. It was like they had him locked up like that. You know. Well, and then even Sean McKinnon. That so he was the one that was supposedly what with the talking with the um, the correctional officers or something, or yeah. used kind of as a distraction, and they kept him in uh, solitary as well in the hole as well. Or but the there was one of them that they let go. Mm-hmm. He he got out on some type of uh, probation, and he went down to his. He, uh, I can't think of his name, but there was a, one of the guys they let go. And then they, then they, he had to come back and be charged with this. But the fact that they let him go, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'll bet you that he's going to be the one that rats on him. That's yeah. I yeah. mean, that's usually how it goes. But uh, well, if he was moved that out, the Colo or is yeah, we were talking about. So why would you? You got three suspects in the murder. One of them actually gets to get out of prison, and the other two go into uh, lockup. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. No. See, there's so many things here that don't make sense. And a lot of people keep thinking like, oh, well, you know what? Are you going to go to whether he's an informant or not? No, our main goal is what we're talking about right now, just to try to piece up whatever. Right. Because it's hard, as you know. I mean, the government's the, the, the biggest mafia in the world. You know, well, that's why I laugh. Lee. A lot of people are like, why do you glorify the mafia? And I'd always be like, I don't. But then at the end of the day, I'm like, wait, you know what? I kind of respect them because. I see how dirty the government is and these guys just didn't want to abide by their rules and do like their own thing within them. So who am I to, you know, why should I be, uh, why should we um, glorify government or for, to, for that say what they don't kill innocent, but they don't kill people and do crazy shit. So I always said the feds are uh, the biggest uh, organized crime group out. And there's so many, uh, there's so many things going on here and I'm glad that you're going to be putting these pieces together and trying to do the best kind of work you can. Uh, James, and we're going to, uh, before we leave here, I like to say one thing, uh, underneath here has been running your, uh, the mafia, uh, truth official channel and, uh, please people, um, sub to him, uh, and look out, look for the work that, that Lomas has coming out. Uh, I think that this, this type of interview that we've done is exactly the type of interview we needed to do with you. And, uh, James, is there anything that you'd like to ask Lomas? Before we yeah, end just, yeah, just one question is, uh, so, you know, we know about the three guys that were charged, but what about, do you know who Felix Wilson was? He was. No, the, not. So when it comes to the whole Freddie Dunkey stone, uh, I know the three was charged, but the name that you're talking about, no, I don't have that all pinpointed though all up just yet. Yeah, I was just wondering, supposedly he was the, going to be the cellmate of Whitey or, or whatever, and, and so... Yeah, uh-huh. and they, I heard, yeah, the, well, okay, yeah, I didn't, no, but the cellmate, did you see who his cellmate was? Yeah, uh, the thing is, uh, Felix Wilson, right? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, so, okay, I thought, I, I totally apologize, yes, the, that's what I was saying about before, he's a black guy, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so now, tell me again what you said about him? No, no, I mean, what, so they placed him in solitary after the murder as well, Felix, uh, so the, the the black guy and what what happened to him though huh. good question i didn't even know what was existed. he you know he was so he's placed in solitary i guess they just wanted to make sure he wasn't um part of a conspiracy or something but yeah i don't know whatever happened to the to that to well, the cellmate that's well, james, all you, james you bring that you're bringing this up you better be careful and look out your window to see if you have any black cars pulling up or guys getting out with <laughs> <laughs> well no, exactly but um you know it's yeah. one of those questions too that if i absolutely had that answer though i would still have to be careful answering it though because yeah, yeah. Um, you know what i mean yeah. though but uh that's very interesting because i was just wondering how much because obviously the, you know something happened you know why he was killed and was what was he doing during this time you know the you know he wasn't supposedly involved in the actual killing but you know what happened so anyway I was yeah just... because that's a total different car because freddie ran like the boston car so that's mm-hmm. a completely different uh um so maybe a guilt by association did it say that you have the numbers on how long they put him in yeah i'm not sure they just said he was put in solitary confinement afterwards so i'm not sure how long he was there so i just thought 
maybe they were just doing it because they weren't sure what happened. But uh, but I did read in an article from uh, the uh, I think from the New York Times where they said that he had they'd actually put the the cellmate in solitary for a while. So okay. the, Fed, the feds didn't bring the, the the hammer down until after he was dead. Then they yeah, said, they well, lock these guys up and do our job now. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what they do. And I just want everyone else to know, too, that Freddie Geese, or Giaz, however you guys pronounce it, excuse me, he, um, uh, he doesn't know either. He just wanted to kill him. This is like officials placing Whitey higher ups just in there. You know what I mean? So the actual people who were killed, I mean, who did the work. Well, two guys, they say, that attacked the body, basically. But it doesn't take much to kill an 89-year-old. No, man. but what I'm trying to tell you is that Freddie, though, doesn't know about any conspiracy. Freddie just wanted to yeah. kill Whitey. Oh, no, the hell no. It's Freddie, it's Freddie's a killer. Yeah. So they be, so ever, if there, are, if there are powers to be that wanted him dead, my point is, like, those powers to be didn't talk to Freddie or nothing. They just knew, oh, you throw this guy in here, he didn't have a chance. You know, you throw Whitey, I'm talking about. You throw Whitey in there, and yeah, you know, and where Freddie's from, uh, you know, he's going to hear Whitey bulges around. Freddie was, Freddie was, Freddie and his brother were two of the most feared guys on the streets of Springfield. And that's fact. I mean, yeah. they, they basically uh, got Aralata where he got because he had those two guys. I don't know. But Lee, I will say this, though. I will. I was out there and Anthony, don't listen, Anthony's very well respected out there from a lot yeah, of people. But you're only, you're only as good as the men you have around you. And that goes for any leader, whether it's John Gotti, the circle you got around you is what makes you... Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I yeah. even like with stuff like this, I'm starting to build a team, and I used to have like a little team, but one weak yeah. link or whatever. Yeah, this ain't, so a, this ain't a knock on Aralata. This is show me your he, friends. Yeah, show me your he friends. Had had no. guy, he had two guys that when he told them to do something, he knew it was going to get it done right. right. You know, Did, okay. and they're the very capable, very the capable. Yeah, brothers were very, the just, like that. Yeah, and the other, and then a follow up on that was so, do you know about so? When Bolger arrived there at Hazleton, uh, they said initially he was assigned to be with Paul de Colagero, and then, but then they switched his bunk to the one with Felix Wilson. Yeah. So, do you know what caused that? I, That's I the could call you right I after. The, I could call you right after the show. Yeah. yeah. This is all stuff that's being like, if you know what I mean. Yep. Sure. Mm -hmm. And Lee understands too because I think he's in an NDA right now. And listen, yeah, I get yeah, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. I'm the creator of this thing and I get it and it's my project and all that. So my say so at the end of the day, it goes, but when there's contracts involved with lawyers and stuff, I just have to really be careful. Yep. Understood. And I really appreciate I mean, of course, if I was you too, I both of you, I'd be like, Well, what about that? What about that? And mm -hmm. um it's unfortunate, though, but not that it's unfortunate. It's fortunate because we're going to get a good docu-series out of it. Yes. But I can really get into detail with you guys. And um, I just want you guys to know I'm very thankful for uh, giving me the opportunity for also, Lee, um, not just throwing up, though, the one video when I was running all around and stuff like that. You know, like you really. If we, inter if we interview people and they say, Lee, we're not happy with that interview, I will either cut out the splice out the parts they want me to get out. Or I will redo it. I've I've redone interviews before. Uh, you know that's just the way. If you're going to do uh, put up a good product, and I got to make sure you're happy when you walk away from here. You well, know? no, and that's what I'm saying though. And then, you know whatever happened in the past, I'm not going to bring up any names. But your old partner, like that's all that was with me. Yeah. And, and I want means, you to know, you know what? I'm at, we're in a spot now. It means nothing to us. Our show's doing good and it's only growing. That stuff's all old stuff. Any feud yeah. I had is old stuff. And uh, I'm in a very happy spot right now. Yeah, and me I'm too, man. And we all make mistakes. And like right when I right when I started this, a lot of other content creators were reaching out to me and doing this. And like one of them, I don't want to mention, though, but trying to make money off an addiction show. Like, what are you yeah. doing, dude? What are you doing? Yeah, like, I just want to, you know, he knows who he is. Yeah. What are you doing? So. Okay, my man, I'm going to call this to an end. I want to thank you for being here, my man. Thank you so much. And, Thank you uh, so uh, much. Uh, I'm going to end this. Can you stay here when I end this? I want to talk to you when this is over. You want to talk to me? Yeah, don't go anywhere. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. James, I hope you had a good time today. Yep, thank and you. Underneath, and then underneath here, you're going to see hit the, uh, hit the subscribe. Hit, uh, hit Also hit the bell. Uh, that gives you the reminder. That's what a lot of people don't do. Please do that. Sometimes you got to hit it twice.
and hit the like. The like's very important. That's what we rely on more than anything at this channel. Thank you all so much and have a nice one.